bottom of your foot, and within two hours you will be dead. But you guys have taught me not to listen to that voice always. And so instead, I just real gently leaned down and reached into my shoe. And what I pulled out two years to the exact day my father made that statement, I would say probably two years to the exact hour he made that statement, if not two years to the exact minute, but I can't be sure of that. What I pulled out of my shoe that day was this. It was the shiniest quarter I had ever laid eyes on. Now, may you, you may come up with how that jumped into my shoe during a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I know how that wound up in my shoe. It wound up from the grace of a loving God that when I walked into you guys 16 years ago, there was nothing that you could tell me that could make me believe in it. And now, a few short 24 hours later, there is absolutely nothing you can tell me that will make me not believe in it. How can I not be grateful for this way of life? How can I not be grateful? You know, those are the kind of experiences that I have had in the short time I've been here. You know, those are the kind of experiences that have saved my life. And those are the kind of experiences that don't feed my alcoholism and don't feed my ego like being a part of something as grand as this can possibly be. And see, when I walked into you, I didn't need my ego fed. I needed my spirit fed because you guys have taught me that when I walked in here, I was dying of a spiritual malady. And that my only hope was remission one day at a time based on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And so I do a series of things, including, you know, being sponsored, sponsoring all the things that I told you to try and maintain that spiritual condition. But one little thing that I do, and every day of my life, and it's silly, but I really enjoy it, and I did it this morning standing in my hotel room, so if any of you saw this crazy old lady in her pajamas this morning with her hair like this, that was me. I, at, when I'm at home, I walk outside my back door while still in my pajamas before I've done anything, and I walk out and I throw my hand up like this and I say, Good morning, God. Chris Campbell here reporting for duty. How may I serve you today, sir? And then if it's a nice day outside, I just take it all in. You see, what happens to me in that exact moment is I turn my life and my will over to a power greater than myself. I am an into action kind of girl. I have to take actions that are contrary to how I'm feeling. And from that moment on, everything that happens in my life is a divine assignment. I did that this morning, so I'm absolutely convinced that that's why I'm standing here in front of all of you this afternoon. This is not by my design. This is by a design by a power greater than me. It also allows me to try and live in a space that I want to live today. And that is a space of a woman of authentic love and service. See, authentic is the most important word in my vocabulary now. Because when I came to all of you, I was anything but. When I came to all of you, I was the crown princess of Fakeitville. No matter what I had to do to try and get you to like me, that was exactly what I did. And what excites me so much is that just a few short 24 hours later, I no longer have to live from the outside in. See, I always thought if my outside looked okay, then it would convince you that my inside was okay. Because somewhere I'd gotten the idea, if you saw how dark and how black, how ugly and broken it was inside of me, there's no way you would be around me. And it's with such excitement and gratitude today that I tell you, the woman I really wish you could see behind this podium today is the one that appears when the tears have washed away all of her makeup. That's when you see the authentic me that tries to live so transparent that you can see what's really deep down inside of me now, where God lives. Because that's the woman that makes a difference in this world, not the one that can dress up and do all of that anymore. You know, so I'm incredibly grateful. But that certainly wasn't the woman that appeared in these rooms 16 years ago because I believe that I'm that real alcoholic that they talk about in the big book. When I appeared to you, I was absolutely crazy. Long before I had taken, you know, 
any serious drinks of alcohol. I had this crazy mind that was always doing me in. I had this mind that was always saying, you're not enough, Chris. You're just not enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not rich enough. You're not athletic enough. You're not smart enough. Whatever it was I saw in you, I would measure myself up to it, and I would think you're just not enough. No matter what you do, you can't measure up. And then this other voice would swoop in. It'd be like, what do you mean you're not enough? You're too much. They're always telling you you're too much. They're telling you you're too loud. You're too rowdy. You're too desperate. You're too needy. You're too emotional. You're too angry. You're too violent. I don't remember them saying you're too nice. But somebody may have said it, but guess what? I would have never heard that because I lived by that 299 to 1 theory that my friend Big Ed M, that's in the meeting in the sky now, used to talk about. 300 people in this room, 299 of you come up to me after this meeting and say, Chris, I'm really glad you were here. I'm glad I got to meet you. One of you comes up to me and says, I don't like your shoes. <laughs> guess who owns my morning, my noon, and my night now. It is you who doesn't like my shoes. And I start thinking about you and I start replaying and then I start having all those conversations with you while you're not there. You know, the ones that you always win. And in about six weeks, I'm finally in enough emotional pain I'm writing inventory on you. And then in about eight weeks, I find myself back in Orlando trying to find you to make amends for all the things I've been saying about you for the last two months, you know? That's how my head rolls when I am left on my own, you know? And I would walk into a room full of people at that point in my life when I was so full of self-centered fear and self-pity that I literally believed I could look at you, I could look you in the eyes, read your mind, and I knew what you were thinking about me. And what you were thinking about me was never nice. But you never knew that I knew what you were thinking about me because I looked an awful lot like my dad. I would walk into a room just all smiles. And it had nothing to do with the fact that there was anything happy, joyous, and free in me. It had everything to do with the fact that I was convinced if you saw how dark, black, ugly, and broken it was inside of me, you were going to recoil in horror and run right out that door. And at that point in my life, there was only one thing worse to me than being in a room with all of you and what you're thinking about me. And that's being in a room alone with me and what I'm thinking about me. Because what you think about me might be mean, but see, what I think about me is absolutely vicious. But at 14 years old, all of that changed. At 14, I had my first experience with as much alcohol as I could put into my system. I had had some experiences before that. I ran around with some girls, and we were a pretty wild bunch. And, you know, 11, 12 years old, we'd con somebody into buying us a six-pack, and we'd each have a beer. And my girlfriends were all normal drinkers. They'd be about halfway through their single beer, and they would be having a normal reaction. They'd be getting giggly, they'd be getting flirty, they'd be having fun. I'm halfway through my allotted beer, and I'm getting itchy. And I'm finding myself getting a little antsy, and I'm getting a little restless, and I'm already thinking about looking for a fight, because i got to do something with all this tension and all this energy inside of me. But clear back then, I had that keen alcoholic mind already, and I had one girlfriend that was particularly fond of the boys and so what I would do is I would measure up the situation and I would find a willing guy and I would don my little cupid wings and arrow and I would hook up my girlfriend and that boy because I knew if I would hook them off hook them up they would go off and do what preteens would go do for 10 or 15 minutes and while they were gone I could have the rest of their beer so the truth is what I'm doing at 11 years old is pimping out my girlfriends to get the rest of their alcohol that was just who I was um, but at 14 like I said all that changed at 14 I had my first experience with as much alcohol as I could possibly put into my system and what happened to me that night is I found the higher power I didn't even know I was looking for you see, alcohol, once I had enough in my system, had the power to take that not enough and bring it right up to just enough. And for the first time ever, I could look you in the eyes. It had the power to take that too much, bring it right down to just enough, and I could look you in the eyes. Alcohol had the power that night for the first time ever. I walked into a room full of people, and I could have cared less what you were thinking about me. See, alcohol had the power to do for me what I was never able to do for myself. Alcohol had the power to change my perception of me.
And what I did was I went on a 20-year pilgrimage to recapture the bliss that I felt in that very first night when I had just enough alcohol in my system. And what I can tell you is I never got there again. And I'm sure some of you understand that. I would get right up to it and could not get there. And I would leave claw marks and everyone and everything as I slid right back out away from that feeling. Or I would zoom right through it and the consequences. And I was always in trouble. And I was not a good drinker. I was like your speaker last night. You know, I drank, I got drunk, and I threw up. You know, that very first night, I found myself wrapped around my parents' toilet. It was the 70s, so I'm sure some of you can picture it. I'm throwing so hard, I'm throwing up so hard, I'm convinced my toenails are coming out my eyeballs as I'm hanging on to that pink shag carpeting for leverage. But what I have is a moment and in my head it says, you know, Chris, this is a real small price to pay for how good you felt earlier tonight. So my first real drunk is still coming out my nose, and I'm already thinking about my next one. That is how my alcoholism came on. It did not come on subtle and slowly. Mine just arrived at the door and said, honey, I'm home. And that was all there was to it, you know? And, and like I said, I wasn't a good drinker. I was always sick. I was always in trouble. And I had those hangovers that in the morning were like a near-death experience when I opened my eyes. But I didn't have a problem with any of that. The only problem that I had with alcohol is that it wore off. Because when alcohol wears off, then all that chatter starts in my head again. And the best way I ever found to describe what happens in my head, unless it's either full of alcohol or Alcoholics Anonymous, is many years ago now, my dad got my son a hamster for Christmas. And if any of you have ever lived with one of those, at that time they had little metal cages with little metal wheels. And at that time they would jump on those little wheels and they run 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 and no matter how much you would oil that wheel, it squeaks. And I remember watching that hamster and thinking, he has got to be exhausted. When is he going to stop doing that? He has to have blisters on his little hamster feet. What is up with this? And I remember thinking, all right, when nighttime comes, that thing has got to stop. So nightfall came, I shut the lights off, and that's when I learned that those hamsters, just like my alcoholism, are nocturnal little rodents. You turn off the lights, and I swear that little hamster threw his arms up in the air and yelled, Parte! And he jumped on that wheel, and they run and they run, and they run and they run, and they run and they run and they run. They run all night long in circles and get absolutely nowhere. That is how my head works, unless it's either full of alcohol or Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and at that time, I became willing to go to any lengths to get whatever it was that I needed to get. And it wasn't always easy, because at that time, like I said, I'm 14 years old. I've had a gross spurt since then. Um, at that time, I was about two foot three. Um, it's, it's incredibly hard to buy alcohol when you can't see over the counter at the liquor store. So, you know, what I had to do is I just learned